At the end of June 1942, a vast Allied merchant convoy named PQ-17 left Iceland to deliver hundreds of thousands of tons of war supplies to the Soviet Union. Of 34 merchant ships to begin the journey, just 11 would reach their destination in one of the worst British naval disasters of the Second World War. This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream, an online subscription streaming site that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access for just $2.99 a month or $19.99 a year. You can also get 30 days for free at curiositystream.com slash historograph with the promo code historograph. More on this later on. Supply convoys to the Soviet Union began in August 1941, as Britain endeavoured to help its new communist ally. With the Red Army hard-pressed by the invading Wehrmacht, the Royal Navy assembled flotillas of merchant ships at Iceland before running the gauntlet of German submarines and aircraft off the north coast of Norway, to arrive in the Arctic ports of Murmansk and Archangel. Given the serial number PQ, the convoys were initially small in scale, attracting only a small Axis response and soon protected by the long Arctic winter night. Of the first 10 PQ convoys, just a single merchant ship was lost. Despite this initial success, the British Admiralty viewed the Arctic convoys as an incredibly risky task. Running flotillas of lightly armed ships with few escorts along a hostile coastline well in range of air and submarine attack and what in the summer would be constant daylight. These anxieties were heightened in early 1942 when the Germans transferred the fearsome battleship Tirpitz to the Arctic. The prospect of Tirpitz intercepting a convoy was potentially devastating. The escort ships were able to engage submarines and aircraft but would be no match for Tirpitz's 15-inch guns. The Allied response was to dramatically increase the number of escort ships, starting with PQ-12 in early March. The merchant ships would now be backed up by the full force of the British home fleet under Admiral Sir John Tovey. When Tirpit sortie to interdict PQ-12 and its companion homeward-bound convoy QP-8, a two-day game of cat and mouse played out, as Tovey's ships tried to intercept Tirpitz while Tirpitz tried to find the convoys. In the end, both sides were frustrated by poor weather, and the German squadron eventually returned to port. The only Allied casualty was the Soviet destroyer Ljora from QP-8's escort, sunk by a German destroyer on the 3rd of March. The next convoy was not quite so lucky. PQ-13 ran into a bad storm, scattering the convoy and helping the Germans to sink five merchant ships. The convoy's escort engaged three German destroyers briefly, with the cruiser HMS Trinidad sinking Z-26 but somehow managing to torpedo herself in the process, due to the extreme cold interfering with the weapon's gyroscope. By mid-April, permanent daylight had arrived in the high Arctic, making convoys even easier to find and easier to attack. Admiral Tovey and the Admiralty in London were keen that the frequency of convoys should be reduced or even halted through the summer months for fear that losses could quickly outstrip any supplies delivered. There was though intense political pressure on Britain to continue the convoys, both from the Soviets and the Americans. PQ-14 left Iceland on April 8th, enlarged to 25 merchant ships at the urging of Roosevelt, but quickly ran into disaster. The convoy was ambushed not by the Luftwaffe or Kriegsarena, but by a thick field of floating ice. Each ship tried to find its own way through and the group was scattered. 16 merchant ships had to turn back with serious collision damage. The Germans accounted for a further merchantman, meaning only 7 ships arrived at Murmansk. It was not enough. There was worse to come at the end of the same month. Three more merchant ships were lost from PQ-15, but more serious were the losses in escort ships. The cruiser HMS Edinburgh was sunk and two destroyers damaged while escorting the returning QP-11, as well as the destroyer Punjabi lost after being accidentally rammed in fog by the battleship King George V. These losses came at a time when the Royal Navy was stretched beyond belief, needing to run major escort operations in the Arctic, the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, as well as trying to fend off advances into the Indian Ocean by an Imperial Japanese Navy at the peak of its powers. 
In particular, destroyers and cruisers were like gold dust, and the Admiralty could not afford the losses. Tovey and his junior officers still argued that the convoys needed to be suspended, but the political and military necessity of keeping the Soviets in the fight overruled them. Preparations continued to run the largest convoy yet towards the end of May. With daylight permanent and bright, Tovey asked for RAF fighters to be based in Russia to try and support the convoys, but was told that the resources simply weren't available. It was known by now, via ultra decrits from Bletchley Park, that the pocket battleships Admiral Scheer and Lutzow had joined Tirpitz and Scharnhorst in northern Norway, creating a formidable surface squadron. In response, the home fleet, reinforced by an American task force, was again deployed to cover PQ-16, a group of 35 merchant ships. To the huge relief of Tovey and others, just seven merchantmen were sunk over the course of nine days before arrival in the Soviet Union. It was a surprising success, but did not entirely end British concerns. Tirpitz and her supporting ships had stayed in port. They might not next time. A month now passed before the next convoy, PQ-17, would run. Ships were needed for a large-scale convoy to Malta, so the Arctic route was temporarily suspended. Anxiety over the German surface ships persisted. Admiral Tovey wrote, the enemy's heavy ships would be operating close to their own coast, with the support of powerful shore-based air reconnaissance and striking forces, and protected, if he so desired, by a screen of U-boats. Our covering forces would be without air support, 1,000 miles from their base, with their destroyers too short of fuel to escort a damaged ship to harbour. It did not bode well. PQ-17 left Iceland on June 27, 1942, a convoy of 34 merchant ships. Together they carried 594 tanks, 297 aircraft, 4,246 trucks, and 156,000 tons of other cargo. PQ-17's escorts followed the same structure as previous convoys. Directly around the merchantman under Commander Jack Broom would be seven destroyers, two anti-aircraft ships, four corvettes, three minesweepers, four armed trawlers, three rescue ships, and two submarines. Close cover for the convoy was a cruiser squadron under Rear Admiral Louis Hamilton, with four cruisers and four destroyers. Distant cover was provided by Tovey's home fleet, with an aircraft carrier, two battleships and 14 destroyers. There was some hope that if the Germans did come out of port, they could be lured west and onto the guns of Tovey's force. On the German side, a plan had indeed been set in motion to use their surface ships to attack PQ-17. Codenamed Operation Knight's Move, it would see two groups of cruiser arena ships converge to intercept the convoy east of Bear Island. The feared battleship Tirpitz would sail from Trondheim, escorted by six destroyers. From Narvik, the pocket battleships Lutzow and Admiral Scheer, plus six more destroyers. It would be the Narvik group's task to attack the convoy, while Tirpitz went after the close cruiser escort. Late on July 2nd, the German surface ships left their moorings and headed north to a staging base at Altenfield. The move got off to a treacherous start as three destroyers in Tirpitz's group plus Lutzow at Narvik ran aground and had to return to port. Meanwhile, far to the north, PQ-17 was starting to come under determined air attacks. In the early hours of July 4th, many of the American merchant ships surprised their British companions by raising brand new Stars and Stripes flags to celebrate the anniversary of their independence from the very same empire they now fought alongside. At 4.50am, a single Heinkel 115 torpedo bomber dropped through the clouds, its engine silent, and glided towards the convoy, dropping two torpedoes. One of these hit and disabled the USS Christopher Newport, forcing it to be scuttled after survivors were taken off. This was just the beginning. At 6.25pm, with the skies clear, a wave of 25 torpedo bombers approached from the south at almost wave height. Best place to engage was to destroy USS Wainwright, which was attached to Rear Admiral Hamilton's covering force and was only present coincidentally to refuel. Seeing the danger, Wainwright charged the attackers, putting up a barrage of fire that forced many of the bombers to drop their torpedoes well out of range of the merchant ships. There was no such lucky escape a short while later, when nine more bombers attacked and Wainwright was not in the same advantageous position. Torpedoes were launched and fatal hits were scored on the William Hooper and Navarino, as well as damaging the tanker Azerbaijan. Four Luftwaffe planes were shot down in the attack, including the attack's leader, Lieutenant Conrad Henneman, 
who was posthumously awarded the Knight's Cross for pressing his attack home both here and in previous missions. Despite these losses, Commander Jack Broom, leading PQ-17's close escort forces, was pleased with how they had performed. He thought that provided the ammunition lasted, PQ-17 could get anywhere. While PQ-17 had been riding out air attacks, anxiety continued to be the prevailing emotion in London as the evening of July 4th drew in. In an unexpected turn of events, ultra-intelligence at Bletchley Park ran into problems cracking that day's German naval code, meaning that any German signals sent between noon on the 3rd of July and noon on July 4th were temporarily unreadable. This was a critical time to have such a lapse, and it left the Admiralty knowing that Tirpitz and others had been on the move on the morning of July 3rd, but had no idea where they now were or what their intentions were. Of key concern was Rear Admiral Hamilton's cruiser squadron, which was due to turn back from the convoy soon, and which did not stand much chance if it was engaged by Tirpitz. The prospect of losing yet more cruisers and destroyers at such a precarious time must have weighed heavily on their minds. By 8pm on the 4th of July in London, a variety of senior officers were crowded into the office of Lieutenant Commander Norman Denning, the officer in charge of reading and analysing decrypted signals from the German surface fleet. Ultra had finally started working again and decrypted messages were coming through, the first of which was a German sighting report that mistakenly reported a battleship amongst Hamilton's cruiser force. Denning told the first sea lord, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, that the apparent presence of such a ship would make the Germans cautious about deploying Tirpitz. Admiral Pound remained worried, and before leaving his office asked Denning if he could assure him absolutely that Tirpitz was still in port. Denning replied that he was confident of that, but could not give absolute assurance pending further decrypts that were soon to arrive from Bletchley. At 8.31, Denning received the evidence he was looking for. Ultra had decrypted a signal sent to German U-boats operating in the Arctic, stating, No own forces in operational area. Position of heavy enemy group not known at present, but is main target for U-boats when encountered. This put any doubt out of Denning's mind. There is no way the U-boats would be told this if Tirpitz was at sea, not least to avoid friendly fire. Denning ran to show the message to Pound, but it seemed that the first Sea Lord's mind on what to do was already made up. The risk of Tirpitz, however slight, was to his mind too great. He decided to remove the concentrated target of more than 30 ships sailing together. At 9.11pm, the first of three signals was sent, ordering Hamilton's cruisers to withdraw westward at high speed. Twelve minutes later came instructions to Broome. Owing to the threat from surface ships, convoy is to disperse and proceed to Russian ports. Admiral Pound then made the command even more stark. Most immediate. Convoy is to scatter. Receiving the signals 2,000 miles away, Broom and Hamilton were shocked. Both men concluded that the urgency of the instructions meant that Tirpitz must be practically upon them, and expected to see gun flashes on the horizon at any moment. PQ-17's destroyers were ordered to link up with Hamilton's cruisers. If they were about to engage Tirpitz, then they would need all the help they could get. But unknown to Broome, just as Denning had argued, all the German surface ships were still in port at Altenfjord, and the convoy was busily shedding itself of protection for no reason. Within a few hours, the 32 remaining merchant ships of PQ-17 had spread out over a huge area to present a less concentrated target to surface ships that would never arrive. Instead, over the next few days, shorn of its cohesiveness and without the best escorts, the merchant ships of PQ-17 were picked off by the Luftwaffe and U-boats, one by one, in the constant Arctic daylight. By the end of July 6th, 16 merchant ships had been sunk. Only 11 would eventually limp into Archangel intact. It was a total calamity. 23 ships had been lost in total, and 153 merchant mariners killed. As a result of the destruction of PQ-17, further Arctic convoys were suspended until the autumn, both to prevent more unsustainable losses and because ships were needed desperately in the Mediterranean for the relief of Malta in Operation Pedestal. This was much to the frustration of the Soviets who were facing strong German assaults in the campaign that culminated with Stalingrad. 
The Allies returned to the Arctic in September 1942 with PQ-18, a convoy of fully 40 merchant ships, accompanied by a vast escort including the new escort carrier HMS Avenger and 73 other ships. There were to be no more chances taken. Thereafter, the Allied convoys continued and alongside other routes of supply played an important role in equipping the, in equipping the Red Army with the tools it needed to sweep the Germans from Eastern Europe in the final years of the war. This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the best place on the internet to go for high quality documentaries on a variety of topics. For example, you might like D-Day Hidden Traces, which uses archaeological evidence to take a slightly different look at one of the turning points of World War II. You can get unlimited access for $2.99 a month or just $19.99 a year. The first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash historograph and use the promo code historograph. Thanks again to CuriosityStream for helping me to make this video possible.